You're listening to Crossroads France, a podcast from Agence France Press. I'm Barney Spender. Bienvenue. And thanks for joining me for the fifth and final episode in this series, which has been looking at the changing culture and character of what we know as traditional France. Our previous four episodes have taken us across the country, from north to south, from Paris down to the Alps. France has always been a major agricultural power. So for the final episode, we're heading west to see how farmers and environmentalists are clashing over the new demands of climate change. We're heading to the Marais Poitvin, a marshland of 970 square kilometers, a home to some of the best farmland in France, some 200 kilometers north of Bordeaux. There's water everywhere. Not surprising to learn that it's known as the Green Venice. The marsh crisscrossed by a lattice of dikes and canals built in the 11th century. But behind this verdant landscape lies another of the existential crises that is furrowing French brows. The marsh is drying up under the combined effect of intensive agriculture and global warming, of which this region, Nouvelle Aquitaine, is a particular victim. Water has been at the heart of an increasingly heated conflict since 2011, when farmers first proposed using water reserves to irrigate their fields. The idea? Pump groundwater in winter, store that water in open-air reserves, and use it in summer. We realized it was ultimately a struggle between so-called intensive agriculture and so-called alternative agriculture, which ultimately crystallizes the debate between the right and the left. For environmentalists, these reserves will weaken the marsh and reduce the availability of water. It's a difference of opinion that's causing great tension, especially in mosée sur le mignon a peaceful town on the edge of the Marais Poitvin and site of the first of the reserves. Crossroads France, episode five, Farmyard France, and the struggle for water. Bonjour, Basile Baudouin. J'arrive à la réserve. I have a journalist with me, just to let you know. Thanks. Merci. If he doesn't have the dogs chained up, then you don't enter. The reserve is guarded 24-7 to protect it against vandalism. Barbed wire is everywhere around the water reserve. This is high security stuff. It's a bunker. Movement detectors. It's guarded night and day. So if an activist does get in, he's stuck between two barriers, and if he gets bitten in the ass, It's a sharp climb up a four-metre hill, but looking down from on top, you see the basin, roughly the size of seven rugby fields. The more I see it, the smaller it seems. The basin serves five arable farms and three with livestock. Fifteen farmers. Basile Baudouin. 32 years old. I have a farm with my brother who is 28. We have 400 goats and we farm 200 hectares. Basile is at total ease as he surveys his farming kingdom, which is located just 600 metres from the water reserve. My father is a farmer, was. He's retired now. He started with beef cows, uh, went into tobacco and ended up as a cereal farmer. In 2012, Basile took over the farm from a couple who were retiring. Their children weren't interested in agriculture and I was keen to raise goats, so it was an opportunity to take over the entire farm with irrigation. By taking over the farm, Basile inherited a borehole which goes down 12 metres. He can use it to pump from the water table and water his fields. But because of the drying up of the groundwater, the local authority is forbidding drawing water earlier and earlier in the year, which is why he needs the basin. 100% of the irrigation went to feeding the goats. We need that water for the alfalfa, soybeans, grain that we grow to feed the goats. If we don't have it, things get complicated. We might be told on August the 1st to stop irrigating. But if it rains, we can start again in two weeks. We don't know. So we stop watering our alfalfa, then we run out and have to buy in from outside. That's what happened two years ago. We lost 15% of what we needed and had to buy in, 30,000 euros. 
We save in good years, but a blow like that can wipe us out. At the moment, Basile's local reserve is the only one of 16 of these planned basins around the Marais Poitvin to be completed. The other 15 are due to be in action by 2025. The project is supported by France's biggest farming union, but opponents are vocal, calling the reserves an ecological aberration, from which only a few farmers will benefit. Opponents also criticise the agricultural model, the factory farming methods used by Basile to raise his goats. These people are telling us how to do our jobs. Maybe we're not doing it properly. So buy a farm, do that for 10 years, do it better than us, and then we'll come and see you. I don't think many people would be able to work 60 or 70 hours a week with an average salary of 800 euros per month. I don't think many people would accept that. Demonstrations have multiplied since the reserves got the green light in 2018. Vandals got in two years ago in the height of summer and broke Basile's water pump with an iron bar. A new one set him back another 8,000 euros. It's all certainly demoralizing. His neighbor, David Paya, also a farmer, even considered leaving France. It's not an objective, it's a question. Does it justify all the work? We've been under pressure for two or three years now. The farmers, particularly around Mose, are the target of all kinds of hatred and ferocious attacks. We're at the heart of agri-bashing. So yeah, we ask ourselves these questions. In November, more than 2,000 people gathered in Mose sur le mignon to protest against the construction of the reserves. Demonstrators cut and set fire to a tarpaulin over an existing basin in a neighboring village, which isn't actually a part of the project. Among them, the spokesperson for the Confédération Paysanne, the third biggest agricultural union. His involvement resulted in an appointment with the police. The basins symbolize a grab for water, which should be for everyone, by a minority of farmers for the benefit of an agricultural model that is against people and animals. It's a symbol of a model that refuses to adapt to climate change. Around 50 people have gathered at this meeting to oppose the water reserve. That's Julien Liguet, who organizes the movement Bassin Non Merci, Basins No Thank You. He says the blame lies with the government. Our position is clear that these reserves are a national issue and people can consider them when they vote. This is a key social project which says a lot about access to resources and social justice and safeguarding the environment. Why did you choose No Bassaran as your slogan? It's just a little pun. That's one of our trademarks, along with humor. It obviously refers to No Passaran, which was the slogan of the anti-fascist and anti-Franco struggle in Spain, meaning they will not pass. For us, the Bassin will not pass. So, who are the fascists? It's true the term fascism is certainly strong. Let's say the grabbers. We're not saying that they are all fascists. <laughs> the anti-basin movement goes well beyond the region, as there's a call to extend the project to other areas of France. The government says it's supporting agriculture in the face of climate change. But these demonstrators see it as the state defending an outdated mode of farming. Someone who shares that view is Vincent Bretagnol, although he has a foot in both camps. A research director in the field of agroecology, he's also part of the scientific committee of the Farmers' Cooperative, which is implementing the 16 reserves. I am neither critical nor negative. I see an opportunity. I hope farmers and society as a whole will seize it because it's an opportunity, a change of model a change of regime, it is never easy. Bretagnol is trying to help farmers make an ecological transition, particularly when it comes to saving water. 
First, that demands a great sobriety from the point of view of both pesticides and water. By increasing biodiversity through the reduction of pesticides, we increase organic matter and improve the soils. And by improving the functioning of the soils, we give them a better capacity to retain water. That's to say, they keep the water more efficiently for the plants, and therefore, there is less water loss. And these questions go beyond the agricultural world. Julien Liguet lives in the heart of Green Venice, in a village of 600 inhabitants. He built his own house using only materials from the Marais. And at every opportunity, he's into his boat and paddling through the marsh. In summer, when I was a teenager, we paddled on a carpet of green lentils. It's like walking on grass on a golf green. And below, there were staggering amounts of algae, ceratophils, water milfoils, elodia, and so on. Today, even in the height of summer, there is practically no vegetation left in the canals, and the whole food chain that goes with it disappears. He's appalled by the damage done by the herbicides, including glyphosate. Three weeks ago, a newspaper article showed that our department is France's record holder in glyphosate use. I believe there's a link between the fact that there's no longer any grass or algae in the Marais Poitvin and the fact that all our waterways are bombarded by these glyphosates and other pesticides. The Marais Poitvin has certainly suffered from intensive agriculture. From 1996 to 2014, it even lost its status as a regional natural park, following the disappearance of 35,000 hectares of wetlands, replaced by crops. The boat is over there. I'm just going to get the pole. Out on the water, all is calm. The water is barely moving. There's a slight breeze. You can hear the animals moving about. You can see otter tracks. A kingfisher darts across the water. More than 300 species of birds and about 50 aquatic and terrestrial mammals live in the marsh. The gay is 45 and has been unemployed for a year. He devotes all his time now to saving the marsh. My job is to make people discover the biodiversity of the Marais Poitvin. My observations strongly lead me to think that this biodiversity, which is collapsing in the marsh, is a consequence of the agriculture that's practiced here and in the fringes on all these watersheds. This is because the Marais Poitvin is the overflow basin for all these waterways. This debate about water sends ripples way beyond the marsh, right across the region. The music you can hear was composed in the Marais Poitvin by Manon Velfranger and Arnaud Guéry, two musicians who came to settle here during the pandemic. This couple, both in their 30s, left Paris and its frenetic pace to open a residence for artists and make music. The marsh has become a source of inspiration. Arnaud Guéry. We compose pieces from what we find in the marsh in terms of sound materials. Inevitably, They've been drawn into the great water controversy. It's quite inseparable from our time here. It's the subject on everyone's lips, all generations, all walks of life. It feeds our view of the Marais Poitvin. It feeds our work as artists and also as the creators of this residence. In fact, the residence was created hand in hand with this debate. When you think about the Marais Poitvin, you cannot not think about the water and therefore about this movement. But I'm quite taken aback to see how few people understand the nuances here. There's a sharp dichotomy in the debate. Today, these positions have become political. That's David Paya, who we heard earlier complaining about the agri-bashing that the farmers are getting. That's to say the opponents of the water reserves are largely the Greens and France Insoumise, so left-wing, extreme-left parties who are for economic regression. 
David Paya is 47. He took over the farm from his parents, who had about 40 cows and 100 hectares of crops. David has three times as many cows and four times more land. Corn, wheat, sunflowers, alfalfa and sorghum. David works with his wife, his brother and a neighbour. A cooperative, in a sense, that embodies the way farming has developed over recent years. Individual farms closing and then regrouping with others to survive. The anti-basin lobby, however, marks them down as agro-industrial. And that's a term that annoys him. We're a victim of the politicisation of this subject. Every morning when we get up, we work to improve our practices, reduce the use of phytopharmaceutical products, while continuing to do our job, that is, producing milk, producing cereals which are also used to feed people, animals, the market, and a little bit the export market too. That's nothing to be ashamed of because the export market brings currencies back to France. We always try to do better, but we get caught up in controversies. David Paya and other farmers connected to the basins claim they're the start of an agro-ecological transition, the argument being that retaining water in winter reduces the depletion of groundwater in summer. The co-op that launched the project also imposes measures to force farmers to save water. For example, they must plant hedges along the edges of fields. That retains the water. They must also reduce their use of pesticides. But opponents say that's not enough. Many are campaigning for sustainable agriculture, which is less mechanised and less water-intensive. They say it's possible because in France, only 5% of agricultural land is irrigated. I think the agricultural world is waking up a bit late. Well, part of the agricultural world. Because some people have understood for years that the model needs to be changed. Planting five metres of hedgerow per hectare might be difficult for some, but we can have them all round our meadows, and that's not a problem. That's Amandine Paco. Eight years ago, the 32-year-old took over her father's farm alongside her husband. They have cows and chickens and grow organic vegetables. The questions of the basins is a big deal for her. I think they went so far in their choices that it's very difficult to go back. It's hard to say I was wrong, because that's a whole farm that needs to be rethought. It's far bigger than just the water question. It's a whole agricultural model that needs to be changed. And Vincent Bretagnol agrees with Amandine. There's a big debate today around the future of agriculture, which concerns both science and society. I would say that there are two ways. There is a way called Agriculture 4.0, digital agriculture, drones, robots. It's advocated strongly at the moment by Europe and the Ministry of Agriculture. And then there's an alternative path which I believe in, which is agroecology. Are these big reserves part of digital agriculture? To an extent, yes. We are implementing technological solutions to face environmental challenges. Water is a resource that's not only shared between farmers. We need water for industry and we need water for biodiversity. So you still have to find a somewhat global vision. The idea of saying, I have a problem, let's find a solution, won't work here today, because quite simply, we are faced with a multitude of problems. Despite his criticisms, Vincent Bretagnol will continue to work with the farmers of the region. He sees open dialogue as the best way to move forward towards a transition he says must be made. A week after our discussion with Vincent, Russia invaded Ukraine. This war has prompted fears of famine in several southern Mediterranean countries, such as Algeria and Lebanon, because Russia and Ukraine combined produce 30% of world wheat exports. We called Vincent Bretagnol to find out if agroecology was compatible with food self-sufficiency. Agroecology is a response to the issue of food sovereignty insofar as agroecological production is based on elements that are local. It is an agriculture that is not dependent on the outside and it produces food that is intended to be consumed locally. And so, it does not depend on a chain of transactions on trips which themselves depend on fossil fuels, and it produces enough to feed the planet. 
Today, of course, we are going through the COVID confinement, the war in Ukraine and the crisis in energy, raw materials and agricultural production. All that may be the trigger that makes people, societies, civilizations start to evolve in the right direction. You've just been listening to the fifth and final episode of Crossroads France, podcast by Agence France Press. Farmyard France and the Struggle for Water was created in French by Camille Kaufmann and is available under the title Turbulence. The other episodes in this series were created by Antoine Boyer and Sarah Lou Lepers. The original music for Crossroads France was composed by Clémence Reliat and Nicolas Vert. Christophe Robert was our engineer, while Julie Pereira did the illustrations. Series editors were Guy Jackson and Michaela cancella Kifa. My name is Barney Spender, and it has been my pleasure to bring you these insights into France in English. Thanks for listening. Au revoir. <laughs>